this question has in it a presupposition, so in that presupposition, you're, I'm gonna let, I think the question is addressed to Micah, but I'm gonna let Barry deal with presupposition as well, okay? Question is, is repentance and faith commanded? And if so, how does the natural man of Romans 8, 7 subject himself to this law since he is unable? That's the presupposition. Does Romans 8, 7 say that man is unable to subject himself to the law? And if it does, what does that speak of an ability to repent in faith? So here's the question. How do the ungodly have godly sorrow and the spiritually dead have living faith? You mean, do you understand that? No. Okay, I, I didn't think. Okay, so here's the thing. The, the, the underlying question is, is repentance and faith commanded? And it's working off the presupposition that Romans 8, 7 says that the natural man cannot subject himself to the law. Um, and I would think y'all would have different opinions on what Romans 8, 7 declares about the natural man there. What, what the explanation. So maybe two minutes to explain that and answer the question of is repentance and faith commanded? Because... Um, I think the, the obvious observation is if one of you is right, then how can they really have godly sorrow and how can the spiritually dead have living faith if the implication is there? So deal with that. Romans 8, 7. What does that say about natural man's ability to submit to the law uh, in connection to repentance and faith being commanded? Um, I think you it ended, so Barry, you will go first, okay? Uh, if you need me to repeat the question, I I'd be happy to submit my 1,000-page thesis on that, uh, maybe in about a year. But here, I'll give it a shot. Then, okay, Romans 8, 7, I think is the scripture, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to law, for it is even not able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, the question was, is repentance and faith commanded? It is an imperative. Repent, or you shall likewise per perish. Let me give you another commandment. Another imperative. You shall not steal. That is an imperative. Let me give you another imperative. You shall not lie. That is an imperative. That is a command. You shall not commit adultery. On and on and on. God gives us imperatives. What is the purpose of those imperatives? What does Galatians say? For the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ so that we might be saved by faith. Now let's go and deal with our Romans passage here. For the mind set upon the flesh is death. But the mindset upon the spirit is life. We have the contrast again between the natural and the supernatural. The man born of the womb must also be born of the spirit because he is dead. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God. That is to say, without an operation of the Holy Spirit in the heart of man conceding, he cannot and he will not respond to God. And I would like to point out the latter part of that verse. For it, the mind set upon the flesh, is not even able to do so. And so those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He goes on to say, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That is, having been born again by the spirit, I appeal again to John chapter 3. Romans, Romans 8, 5 says, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Okay, that means they obey the things of the flesh. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is Death. Well, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Somebody that's carnal is governed by the flesh, governed by the senses, as opposed to being governed by the Spirit of God. The carnal mind, to be carnally mind is death, but to be spiritually mind is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. They that are in the flesh, uh, cannot please God. So, it's it's not talking about an inability. It's talking about somebody who is in rebellion against God, not submitted to the law of God, because they are living, minding, and being governed by the flesh, governed by the senses, governed by selfishness, as opposed to being governed by a heart of love and obedience towards God. Uh, it doesn't say anything in there about an, uh, it, that, that's, that's something that, that you're reading into it or, or putting in there that, 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 that's not in there. It doesn't say he, he's unable to. It doesn't say it's an impossible for him. It says that he's not doing it. 
And, and because he's now, now because he's not doing it, you can't please God. <laughs> you can't please God if you're living in disobedience to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith seeks God. question for both of you. If a man is justified by faith and prior to justification is dead in trespasses, I think you mentioned that, does not Ephesians 2.5 tell us that God makes us alive before the justification that is by faith? The question is, does he feed, so the question would be, are we justified by faith and prior to that dead in our trespasses and sins? If that's the case, then does Ephesians 2.5 tell us that God makes us alive before we're justified by faith? Uh, Micah, you'll go first. You get two minutes. Um, Barry, you'll get two minutes for that. And maybe you can even use that to talk about the implications of, of what you're doing. Well, you know, we keep saying this, but it, it, it doesn't. Ephesians 2.1, you have the quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. No denying that. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worked in, this, in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past in lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, where by nature the children wrath even as others. So it's talking about something that they did. They walked according to the course of this world. They fulfilled the lust and the desires of their flesh. It wasn't something... Uh, that was involuntary and against their will. They chose to do it. They chose to disobey. Now, I'd like to point out here Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So it was after they heard the word of truth, after they heard the gospel of salvation that they believed, that they were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. It's good to appeal to Ephesians 1.13, but if you're going to appeal to Ephesians 1.13, let's just go on up to Ephesians 1.4. Let's start at the beginning. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy. Now, who chose? He chose us in him. He predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. He freely bestowed upon us the beloved. Now, context. So then he predestined, according to verse 4, before 13, you listened. Now then the text is actually that we're being questioned on is Ephesians 2 and 5. Even when you were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive. Who? He made us alive together with Christ. This has to do with what we talked about earlier with Ephesians 2 1. You were dead. If you were not necessary for you to be, if you were not dead, it would not have been necessary for you to make you alive. If you were capable of listening and hearing, it would not have been necessary in Ephesians 1 4 to predestine you to the adoption. That's keeping it all in context. Question for both of you. Uh, Barry, you'll go first. Uh, can you lose your salvation? So this is a three-pronged question. Can you lose your salvation? If so, how many times can you lose your salvation? The third question would be, do you go to hell if you are sinning at the exact moment, at the exact time you die? If you die at the exact you die while you're sinning, in other words. So, can you lose your salvation? If so, how many times can you lose your salvation? Can you use it day, lose it daily? And if you if you die at the moment that you are presently sinning, do you go to heaven? That'll be thesis number two. Oh, no. um, First John one eight. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He's speaking to the believers. The question was, it, I think the question was, can you lose your salvation? Well, that all depends. That all depends on who did the saving. The logic is logical that if you did your own salvation, if you saved yourself, then you must maintain your salvation. The standard of God is perfection. Who 
James tells us that one who violates one area of law is in violation of the entire law. So if it is necessary for you to maintain your own salvation, if you save yourself, then you must indeed be perfect. So it all depends upon your, what, what perspective you take. Now, I cannot lose my salvation because my faith is not in me because I did not save myself. If Christ saved me, then I am saved. If the scripture says that no man can snatch him from our hand. He that had begun a good work in us is faithful to perform it to the end. So it's all a matter of perspective. It depends on who did the saving. The logic is if I save myself by reforming myself and turning over a new leaf and becoming a new man and cleaning up and acting right, then I've got to continue to maintain that perfection of the law. That means every thought that I'm aware of, every thought that I'm not aware of, morning, night, and day must be 100% perfection or I will go to hell. Or Jesus Christ paid for my sins upon the cross and I am secure, not in my own operation, but in his operation for what he has done for me. Barry mentioned John 10, 28, but he didn't mention 10, 27. He said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I will give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You can only use John 10, 28 if you use verse John 10, 20, if you use John 10, 27. Sheep hear his voice, obey him, and follow him. First John 1, 7 says, If, if is a condition, if we walk in the light, God is light. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The only way to have the blood of Jesus cleanse you and cover you, all your sin is for you to walk in the light, walk in the truth, walk in obedience. The, can you depart from God? Is Jesus Christ God? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If that was an impossibility, that would not have been in the Bible for believers to exhort one another. James 5.19 Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converted, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death shot a multitude of sin. Who is James writing to? Number one, he's writing to brethren. If any of you do err from the truth, err means to depart from. Can you depart from God? Can you depart from the truth? 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. If any of you do err from the truth, who's the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, the brother that departs from the truth needs to be converted back. If any of you, if it, brother, if any of you hear from the truth and one converted, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. What is the wage of sin? The brother that turns from, departs from the truth that needs to be converted, turn back again. If he does not turn back, he'll experience eternal separation from God. I think the question was originally addressed to you, Mike. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer the second part. Uh, how many times could someone lose their salvation if you even would have an answer to that? And does someone go to hell if they're sinning at that exact moment? The Bible always speaks about God's conditional forgiveness and mercy. If sin is not repented of and forsaken, there's no covering for it in the Bible. If somebody is continually going out into sin and disobedience to God, there's been no repentance there. There's been no change of heart. Repentance is not abstinence. Repentance is a change of heart, change of mind, change of lifestyle. You know, uh, you have to abide in Jesus. Who's, Jesus is eternal life. And 1 John 5, 12, He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. If you, if you die in sin, if you die where you've departed, do you have to rebel against God to sin? Yes, you do. If you die in rebellion against God, how does the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse you and cover you from your sin if you didn't repent? 2 Peter 2.20 uh, 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 2 Peter 2.20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled there and overcome. The latter is worse than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known 
the way of righteousness, then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So, you know, this, this whole thing about uh, how many times can you lose your salvation in one day? <laughs> you know, anybody that's going out and keeping on uh, going out in rebellion against God continually, they've never repented. There has been no change of heart. Repentance is what you used to love, now you hate. You've had a change of heart. Few more questions. This one question, I'm going to modify it a little bit so that it can apply to both of you. The question is, if it's up to the person, you know, to repent and believe, then what can God actually do? So I'm going to modify that and ask each of you a, a, a question. I'll I'll start with you, Micah, so that you can very finish the very last question. So the question for you, Micah, would be this: If um, when, G, when the Bible says that Jesus saved, we say that Jesus saves sinners. Does Jesus really save people if if they still got something they've got to do to complete the act? Can we honestly say that salvation has been accomplished by Jesus, or just a way is made for Jesus for us to save ourselves? Okay, Barry, I will ask you this. Okay, can God be called a loving? Can we can we really say that God loves sinners if? If you're saying that he consigns a portion of sinners to to hell before they you know they don't get a chance to repent, okay? Right. Good person. Well, Acts two forty said Peter said, "Save yourselves from this untoward generation." I mean, clearly, man has a part. First Corinthians four fifteen, Paul said, "In Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel." Does that mean that salvation came from Paul? Does it mean that Paul was the author of it? God had no part in it? The, Jesus said, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. The Bible says in Matthew 1, 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus did not die to save in sin. He died to save from sin. You save a drowning man from drowning, you don't leave him in the water, you get him out of the water. He's still in the water. He's not safe in the water. Hebrews 5.9 said about Jesus being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation on the all them that obey Him. Jesus said in Matthew 7.21, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. It's only those that obey and do the will of the Father, whose Jesus is their Lord, who are going to go to heaven. You know, most of the time the will of God is not done. Uh, there have been in the past Christians who have committed fornication. I don't believe you're, you're going to go to heaven if you die in fornication. But 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Well, if the will of God is always done, and God commands us to abstain from fornication, and a, sin, and a, and a saint goes out and commits fornication, then the will of God wasn't done. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Please. So the question I had you kind of give the, the reverse of, uh, so can we call God loving? Loving to sinners if he only is willing to save some sinners. Now we're asking and we're making an accusation. There's an assumption of the accusation that God is unjust unless he saves everyone. Here's the problem. Bob and I both believe God people go to hell. So is God unjust because I'm a Calvinist or is God unjust because I would call him a Pelagian? We both have the same problem. I'll go to Romans 9. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? And I will appeal to the prophets also. Will not the righteous judge do right? The issue is not that God sends people to hell. The issue is that sinners go to hell because they break God's law. That's the problem. And now, can now God has two choices. Well, actually, he's got several, but let's look at two. He can leave them alone. He can do nothing, and they all go to hell, and he'll be completely just. He can open the door and give them an invitation to come in if they would like. 
and leave it totally in their hands and God does nothing. Or he can have mercy on some and elect some to go to heaven, knowing that not one of them, not one of them deserves heaven. How can you say God is unjust? You want the justice of God? I'll give you the justice of God. Everybody goes to hell. That's what you want? Or do you want a God who would be willing to exercise mercy on some? The question isn't, has God elected you? The question is, do you see the need for a Savior? The question is, as you have examined the law of God, do you see your fault? Because God stands with arms wide open. And the imperative is to repent and believe. So you either have a God that opens the door and leaves it in your hands, or you have a God who's merciful upon a humanity that deserves no mercy at all. This is the last question. Okay, we'll let Barry go first, and Mike, you get the last part. Okay, so the question is, how do I pray for a lost family member? I'm going to add this implication coming from both of your points of view on theology. Barry, the question to you is, how do I pray for a lost family member since it seems to imply that you believe that God's sovereign and he's going to do whatever he wants anyway? And so why even pray? To you, Micah, I'm going to ask, how do I pray for a lost family member when God can't really change them? They have to change themselves. So why even talk to God about them if he can't change them since it's their responsibility to change themselves? Okay. God is sovereign. Well, here's your options. Option number one is you have a God who is not sovereign. You have a God who is not in control. You have a God that sits in heaven and wrings his hands and just rolls the dice and golly gee, I just hope it all works out for you. Why even bother praying to that God at all? What kind of God is that? Or you have a God who is sovereign, who is in control of all things. The, the scripture says that the, uh, righteous prayers of, the, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So God has ordained all things to come to pass. In fact, he's ordained them in one act. Got to wrap your mind around that. But in his ordination of ordaining all things to come to pass, he has also provided the means by which they shall come to pass. Therefore, pray. Because prayer is a means by which God works out his sovereign will. All right. Again. I've never stated that salvation is totally a work of man. Okay? It is a work of God and man together. The Spirit of God must convict the sinner of his sin. When he is, John 16, 8, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But man must yield. Man must humble himself. Man must repent. Man must turn. Man must allow the Spirit of God to deal with him. The Bible says, the Bible says over and over again, it says things like, quench not the Spirit, uh, uh, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. So, uh, we're, we're responsible. You know, Paul said in uh, Colossians 1.29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. The Bible says, again, you know, it, 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 it's not just uh, all up to the person. The person must yield to the conviction of the Spirit of God, the dealing of the Spirit of God. The, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. So we must, we must yield to the Spirit of God. You know, without the Spirit of God, man is able but unwilling. It's the grace of God that, that, that subdues man's heart, causes man uh, to humble himself. But, but, it's not irresistible. Because the Bible says in Acts 7.51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so to ye. Right, well, that's the, the last of the questions. As we'll be closing now. I want to commend both of you guys. Good job. Thank you all for so much. I'm Frank, I, I think you're going to close this out. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. Okay. Go ahead, okay, go ahead. We're going to yep. close this out. I want to pray for us. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Four minutes each.
closing statements. Um, but, yeah, you already did that. You already did closing already. statements. But if, yeah. if, if you guys want no. two minutes each, no. are you good to go? No, we're fine. Okay, all right. Let me close this in prayer. Once again, thank you guys for being willing to do this. Thank you, God. Father, I pray for your grace and your mercy upon each of us. So thankful for each of these men to come out and to share their hearts. Thankful, God, that you have given them concerns for the lost. I pray, Father, that, that Lord, we, Lord, as Christians, would endeavor to accurately know the gospel, to know that we're accurately sharing the gospel with a lost and dying world that needs the gospel. So be with us, protect us, watch over us, and bless us tomorrow on the Lord's Day as we worship. In Christ's name.